All right, good. Let's go through out of six. So you all went through, go all the way down to theories of acids and bases. Is that right? So just, I'm going to start by asking you all a couple of questions about this. So we'll start with Tanisha. What is the first theory of acids and bases regarding the voice? What did he come, what conclusion did he come to? Proud? He said that um, acids, like, acids and bases contain oxygen. Acids contain oxygen, right? So remember here, he's trying to define an acid. Okay, so the voice here, I remember the voice here has an O for oxygen. Okay, what was the flaw, Mahe, with the voice here's theory that acids contain oxygen? Um, Yes, yeah, so there are binary acids, that's what you want to say. There are binary acids that don't contain oxygen. And Rav, what's another flaw? Good, right? So that's all you need to know. The key pro was he was the first one to define an acid by composition. Right? Very good. Quickly, come and take a seat. You're getting the next question. So, next theory is regarding Humphrey Davy. Right? So... What did Humphrey Davy propose regarding acids and bases? Uh, so that, um, acid contains yeah. And, then it and how, what reaction did he use, Tanisha, to come to that conclusion? No. Rabab? Very good, right? So he got an acid, reacted it with a metal, and hydrogen gas was produced, which came to the conclusion that the hydrogen was derived from the acid. Make sense so far? Good. So then it takes you to Arrhenius' theory, which is one of the most high-yield theories, because there are many pros, many cons. Mahir, define an acid according to Arrhenius' theory. Um, in? What solution? Good. An aqueous solution. And Pranav, what about bases? Very good. Now, what were the three key pros of Arrhenius theory? I'm going to get one by one. So starting with you. What was the key pro of Arrhenius theory? You could explain that, sure. Not a major pro. I would not have it at the top of my answer. Good. He led to the development of the pH scale because now we can say since acids release hydrogen ions, we can measure the concentrations of acids using a negative logarithmic scale. Very good. Rabab, another pro. Very good. What was the net ionic equation for now for neutralization? Good. Mahe, what's another pro? Um, it explains the behavior of acids and bases. Very good. So a shift to explaining behavior, which is broader. Next. No other pros? You need to be revising. All of you, the one thing I expect is when you come to my class, you remember the key things from last. I'm not asking you all crazy questions. These are band, band two level questions. You should know them, okay? Good. Next. Good, right? How do we define strength for God? When do we say an acid is strong or weak? What about the Arabs will tell you whether it's a strong or weak acid? If it's strong, the reaction will go to completion, right? All reactions will go to the right to some degree. But when it goes to 100% completion, that is a strong acid. Give me an example of a strong acid. Good. Okay. And if it forms an equilibrium, what do we say? It must be a weak acid. So this is all about what? Degree of ionization. What are these molecules or what are these species? They're ions. So ionization is what we're talking about here. If the degree of ionization is 100%, it is a 
from acid. Does that make sense? All you should get a red pen and write that down. Degree of ionization is what determines whether an acid is strong or weak. Very good. We've gone through the pros. Those are the key pros that I wanted to hear. In a long response, I'm not going to be here to prompt you. You will need to know those key pros yourself. pH scale, neutralization, strength of acids and bases, you must have in your answer. What was the main con of Arrhenius theory? That if you don't mention this, you will you completely you don't understand acids or bases. What was the key con? Yeah, very good, right? Did you see the ending of both of your definitions was in aqueous solution? Acid-base reactions don't need to happen only in water, right? We can have reactions in gaseous state that are neutralization. Arrhenius could not explain that. There are some substances that are acidic in water, but neutral in other solvents, like hexane, right? Could Arrhenius explain this? No, right? And in our acid-base reactions, look at this. This is the ionization of an acid. Do we see the aqueous? Do, do we see the solvent in this reaction? No, we don't see water reacting here. So Arrhenius completely discounted the role of the solvent, which is very important in determining acidity and basicity. What was another issue, Maya? They are bases. Sodium oxide, acidic or basic? Good. Does it have a hydroxyl group in it? But it's basic, right? Could Arrhenius explain that? No. What about sodium carbonate? Does that have a hydroxyl group inside its structure? But is it basic? Yeah. Okay. So what are some other issues? Tanisha? Yep, so that's what we just mentioned. Ruba? Um. Any other? Yeah, so they behave differently in different solutions, which is to do with sulfur. So that's back to point one. Yeah, so that highlights the solvent issues. That's again point number one. Very good. I like that, right? Um, I forced you all to critically think because that's not even written here in the notes. But one major issue is there are some salts that have no hydrogen or acidic, right? This is something that's an issue with the next theory as well. So in the next theory, we'll come to that. These are what we call amphoteric substances. We'll talk about all of that soon, but very good. All right, so that leads us in the early 1900s. Two scientists came up with their own theory. Tell me about that theory. Yes, tell me about it. What's the definition of an acid according to Bronson Matter theory? Good, that's all I want to hear. Okay, so let's not complicate things. What Bronsted Lowry theory states is let's talk about acids and bases and neutralization in terms of a proton. What is a proton, Tanisha? Good. What is it also? Who can give me another name for a proton? Very good. Proton is a hydrogen ion. But do you see how we didn't mention aqueous at all in this definition? We just said it's a proton donor. So according to Brunted Lowry theory, it's very simple. If you don't mention these three points, you're not going to get the mark for the definition. I don't want the complexity here. Acids, proton, donor, base, proton, acceptor. Now, what is neutralization? It's an acid base reaction. If you have a donor and acceptor, do you all agree there's been a transfer of protons? So we can define neutralization as proton transfer. Two words. Every single definition is two words in Bronson Larry theory. Proton donor, proton acceptor, proton transfer. Not too hard. The big difference happens when you start writing equations, right? So according to Arrhenius theory, HCl would ionize to form H plus ions and easy. And the state must be 
Yeah, all right. But according to bronsted larry theory, what we do is we need to include the solvent in the reaction. The main error of Arrhenius theory, bronsted larry theory, is directly accounting for. They're putting the solvent in the reactions. You'll see that. Now, what happens? What did we say? A proton is just a hydrogen ion. Well, think of it as a hydrogen. A proton is a hydrogen. So if you're going to transfer a proton, that hydrogen, since this is an acid, is going to be donated. Do you all agree? So what are you going to form in this process? What is this called? Hydronium, right? What kind of bond, special bond, exists in the hydronium ion? Coordinate covalent bonding. Because remember what happened. It's, an, it's a water molecule, but... The hydrogen ion will come along and it will form a special bond where both these electrons are from the oxygen. Do you all see that? The hydrogen ion has no electrons to give in a, in a bond. It just takes both the electrons off that oxygen. So this is not a sharing of electrons. Do you all agree? It's literally, if you came and took two remotes from me, you robbed me, right? That's what literally the hydrogen is doing to the water molecule. It's robbing it of two electrons. It's not a sharing, so it's not really a covalent bond. So we call this a coordinate covalent bond. Good. Good. Now, what happens to the other substance? It's lost a hydrogen, so it just forms. Yeah. Do you see how different the reaction looks now? Very good. Any questions so far? Okay. Now, I'm going to get you to do this for a whole other reaction. Give me the bronsted larry reaction for acetic acid. Acetic acid is vinegar. Do it as fast as you can. I'm going to walk around and see who's getting the reaction. You've got lots of charge in the very uh, Plus. Good. You have plus? Nisha, what's the charge of water? Water? Yep. Yeah. Good. So should your water have a charge next to it? So what are you going to do to that charge? Next to your water? Good. Good. All right. So coming here, we've got our acetic acid. Always combines with water. Okay. Now, what did I tell you about acetic acid? Yes, but which hydrogen is actually donatable or ionizable? Last one. You don't touch anything else, right? So what we need to do is we need to transfer that hydrogen. So is this a strong or weak acid? We said. Equilibrium arrows, right? That's how we represent that. Now, what's going to happen is we form this ion here. What do we call that? The acetate ion or a thanoate ion. This is also known as ethanoic acid. So the the ion that it leaves behind is the thanoate ion. Okay. Now we also will form hydronium because that hydrogen would be donated to the water. Make sense so far? Now the reason I brought this reaction up is do you all agree this reaction is going in both directions? Now let's start defining these terms here. Who's the acid? Ethanoic acid. Why? Because it donated a proton. Do you all agree? Who's the base here? Yeah, water accepted a proton. Do you all agree? So a neutral substance, a substance we think of as having a pH of 7, is a base. Do you realize now, acids and bases, it's a behavior. It's not a composition anymore. Water is behaving as a base, although it's not intrinsically basic. Okay? So here we're going to call this a base. Why? Because it accepted a proton. Look at what happened on the other side. Now, I want you to go in the opposite direction for me. 
I haven't finished the reaction. So finishing the reaction off, this should be H3O plus aqueous, aqueous, liquid, aqueous. Going backwards, what is a hydronium ion doing, everyone? It's donating a proton. Do you all see that? It's giving the proton back to the thanoate ion, which is going back to form methanoic acid. So we would call that a acid. And what about the thanoate ion? What is that doing? It's accepting a proton. So what do we call that? Good. So we have acids and bases on both sides of the reaction. Do you all agree? But do you agree? They're very similar to one another. This ethanoic acid is very similar to the ethanoate. How do they differ? By one hydrogen. What about water and the hydronium? How much do they differ by? They're kind of like inverses of one another. With hydrogen, without the hydrogen. We call this conjugates. Okay? So if this is your acid... We call its conjugate, aka the molecule that's one hydrogen different to it, the conjugate base. Okay? The conjugates are always in the product side. The original substances, we call them acids or bases. Okay? I'll write the full word for you. You shouldn't just write C base. Please write conjugate base. And it differs by one hydrogen. Good. And what about the acid on the other side? What would you call that? Since this is the base, we're on the product side, so it's a conjugate now. It's one hydrogen different. Do you all see that? The water and hydronium. What do we call that? Good. Now, I didn't mention this for you with the HCl, because HCl doesn't go backwards. But we still call things acids and conjugate bases, etc. So if this is the acid, who's the conjugate base? CO minus. You literally just think, what happens to that acid on the other side? Whatever it ends up as, that's the conjugate base. Make sense? What about the water? That's the base because it's accepting a proton. So follow it. What happens to it on the other side? That's it. Make sense? Not too hard. Okay, very good. Now, the final thing I'm going to introduce is a very important concept. Very important one. When we're talking about strengths of acids and their conjugate bases, it works on this principle. If you have a very strong acid, like HCl, strong acid, its conjugate is going to be very weak. Okay? So the conjugate of a strong is very weak. That is a first principle. You should all write that down. So your title should be acid, uh, acid base conjugate pair strength. I'll write this with you. Acid base conjugate pair strength. Are you all learning this at school? Already finished this? All right. Okay, well, good. All right. And Pranav, same with you. You haven't learned this yet? Um, yeah, we started. Okay. Is you already learned conjugate pair strength? Or... Okay. Well, you're learning it now. All right. So what did we say? The conjugate of a strong acid or base is a very weak ion. Okay. Now, how do we define weak, everyone? Degree of? If it's strong, it ionizes to? 100%. If it's weak, it partially ionizes. If it's very weak, it doesn't ionize at all. It doesn't do anything. So have a look at this. What did we say? We said HCl is strong. Do you all agree? So what will its conjugate base be? Very weak. Okay? The conjugate of a strong is very weak. Okay? Look at how weak this base is. Do we agree? We're calling, we're calling CO minus a base, a conjugate base. What do bases do, Rabab? Oh, the proton Good. But have a look at this. Is this chloride able to take a proton from H3O plus and go back? 
Is there a reverse reaction at all? No, nothing. Do you all see that? To the conjugate of a strongly so weak that it can't even ionize, it can't even act as a base. Do you all see that? Very good. So principle number one is the conjugate of a strong acid or base is a very weak base or acid. So you write no reverse reaction. Very good. Now, let's go back, everyone. Let's go have a look at ethanoic acid. I want you to come to a conclusion for me with ethanoic acid. Or um, even this reaction here. This base. You'll agree it's a base, right? What is it doing? It's taking a H from your uh, H2O. Do you all see that's taking a H from the H2O, acting as a base, a proton acceptor, and the H2O is now depleted of the hydrogen, so it forms the hydroxide ion. Okay, so in this case, everyone agrees that the donor here is water. What is acting as an acid? What is the bicarbonate doing? It's acting as a base. Have a look at this though. What can you tell me about this, this arrow? Is it going to completion or equilibrium? So, Mahe, is bicarbonate a strong or a weak base? If it was strong, what would it ionize to? which means there'd only be a single directional arrow. Because if it goes back, it hasn't ionized to completion. There's always some residual bicarbonate ions. So again, strong or weak? Weak. It's weak because it formed an equilibrium. Does that make sense? If it was strong, it would ionize to completion. There'd be no bicarbonate remaining. Does that make sense to everyone? If you ever see an equilibrium arrow, it's weak. If you don't see one, it is strong. Everyone with me? So we can say this is a weak base. What is the conjugate of the bicarbonate ion, everyone? Yeah, just follow it. What happened to the bicarbonate? It accepted a proton and became carbonic acid. Is this a strong acid or, or weak acid? Think hard. Is it ionizing to completion? Is there a single directional arrow going backwards? So is it strong? No. It's that simple. If there's not a single directional arrow, it is? Yes. So what conclusion have we just come to now? The conjugate of a weak base or acid is a weak acid or base. So the two things you just have to remember, you don't, you don't even have to remember this. Did you see how we just derived this? If you know HCl is a strong acid, you have an example of a weak acid like ethanoic acid, you can come to your own conclusion. But the conjugate of a strong is so weak it can't even react. The conjugate of a weak is a weak. So a weak acid gives you a weak conjugate base. A weak base gives you a weak conjugate acid. So that makes sense? Okay, very good. We're gonna come back to this. I'm gonna ask you a lot of questions now. Do we understand conjugate acid-base pairs for now, right? All you need to do is if you follow the acid to the other side, that's the conjugate base. You follow the base to the other side, the conjugate acid. Strong acid, what arrow? There's double arrows, it is always weak. Very good, good. What were the strengths of bronsted larry theory? If I will we'll start with you, what was the strength? That's the main thing you have to mention. I'll give you a little tip. You need to learn smart. If you just memorize stuff, very hard, right? So how are you going to remember all the pros of bronsted larry theory? Tables are hard. Tables can have random. Have a little rule of thumb. All the pros of bronsted larry theory are the cons of Arrhenius theory. So if you remember the cons of Arrhenius theory, you remember all the pros of bronsted larry theory. Arrhenius didn't account for the solvent. He didn't or couldn't explain metal oxides and metal carbonates. Guess what? Did we not just explain carbonates? Have a look at this. 
we're explaining how a carbonate is forming hydroxide ions. What is a carbonate doing? It's a proton acceptor, so it's acting as a base. What is a conjugate acid of the uh, carbonate ion? Is that carbonic acid? That's the bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate ion. Very good. This is your conjugate acid. And what about this? This is your, which is a acid. And if you follow it through to the other side, what do we call this? You see double arrows. So is anything strong here? No. So you can say this is a weak base. So what's the strength of the conjugate uh, acid? Yeah, it'd be a weak acid. In fact, this one's a, a rare exception where this is also still slightly, slightly basic. Okay, but don't worry about that. We'll come to that when we, when we get there. Good. So we're explaining carbonates and hydroxides. We've accounted for the role of the solvent. Very good. Now, there is one more huge pro of bronsted lowry theory. Pranav, tell me what it means to be amphiprotic. This is your perfect example. Good. So define it in terms of Bronson Larry theory, right? So an amphiprotic substance can act as both a proton donor and a proton acceptor. Very good, right? Now in this case, is it only the water that's amphiprotic? What else is acting or exhibiting amphiprotism? You need to be very specific. The bicarbonate ion. Hydrogen carbonate is one of the most important amphiprotic substances we know. Okay? So the way you explain an amphiprotic substance is you simply explain it acts as bronsted lowry acid or a base. It can accept or donate protons. Now have one reaction with that substance and you could have water or you could even have, let's do our own amphiprotic reaction. So we could have bicarbonate plus acid. What would happen, everyone? Write the reactions. And then bicarbonate plus base. What do we form? Very quickly. Good. Good. How do I know that? Because I know hydronium is a very strong acid, right? It's literally the defining feature. All acids will release hydronium ions, right? So this is a very strong acid. So it forces the bicarbonate to act as a base. What do bases do? Except protons. So I'm literally going to take a hydrogen from that hydronium ion and attach it to my bicarbonate. For the next reaction, I know hydroxide is a strong base, which is going to force the bicarbonate to act as a acid. Does that make sense? What do acids do, Reba? Exactly, right? So that's going to form carbonate ions because we would have donated the proton. And what's left? We would have also formed water because the hydroxide would accept the proton acting as a base. Okay, I want you all to label it too. So this is your base, this is your acid. What are your conjugates? Good. Uh, yep, you're right. And that would make water the conjugate. Good. And what are in the other case? What about the carbonic acid here? Are you sure? Yeah, right, because the bicarbonate here is acting as a base. So when you follow it through, it'll be a conjugate acid, okay? What about the H3O plus? Good, easy, done. They're all masters of bronson lowry reactions. That's, it doesn't get more complicated than that, right? Any questions so far? Good. We're going to keep on revising this. When you, the rest of this module, you'll be practicing what you just learned today, every single reaction. So don't fret, you'll get faster and faster at this. But do we have any questions at all so far? Good, glad it makes sense. Um, 
Now, we'll talk about the weaknesses of Bronson and Lowry theorem. This is not as high yield. It's good to mention in a long response. When should you mention it? What kind of question verb? And discuss. Discuss is pros and cons, evaluate is pros, cons, and judgment. So whenever you need to state cons, you mention these, okay? Now, the main, one of the main cons of Bronson and Lowry theory is this. Have a look at these reactions here. Have a look at this one. What's going on here? What is this substance? Is it equal basic? It's basic. What are we forming on the right-hand side? A salt? And? What kind of reaction is this? It's a neutralization reaction. So what is a neutralization reaction? We need to have a base and we need to have a? Is there an acid here? Do you see a proton that can donate? There you go. This substance is what we call an amphoteric substance. Okay? Now, a lot of students get confused with this. Now, what's the definition of amphoteric again? Uh, that's when a substance impacts on the acid base. Remember, how did we uh, define uh, it? A proton is Good, right? So you can say Bronsted Larry acid bracket proton donor, Bronsted Larry base proton acceptor, but never be vague with it, okay? An amphoteric substance is kind of like the umbrella term. An amphoteric substance can act as an acid or base. So what you've been defining all along is an amphoteric substance. Within amphoteric, if it has a hydrogen attached to it, we call it amphiprotic, because it has a proton that it can donate or accept. Does that make sense? So the umbrella term is amphoteric. Anything that can act as an acid or base is amphoteric. If it has a proton to accept or donate, it is amphiprotic. What does protic mean? Proton, hydrogen. The name tells you everything. Yeah. Very good. Any questions so far? Good. So, again, this is an amphoteric substance. Have a look at this. In this case, what is the aluminium oxide doing? It's reacting with an acid to form a salt and water. Have a look at that. Can Bronsted Larry explain this? No. I don't see any proton donation going on. So that tells you that it's not really even the proton that defines an acid. So what's the most recent theory that we have about acids and bases? Okay, who can tell me what the Lewis theory states? So, um, Fab? Uh, Are you sure? Are you sure? This acid is an electron acceptor. So you're right the first time. And it's not electrons, electron pairs. Okay? And you're actually talking about the same thing. So when you were talking about Bronson Larry theory, you just need to shift your focus from the protons that are moving to the electron pair. Have a look at this, right? So think about Bronson Larry theory. Let's maybe actually I should give you another um, structural diagram to help you all out. So we'll talk about ammonia, right? So this is ammonia. What does ammonia do? It, is it an acid or base, everyone? Yeah, right. So, so we'll talk about ammonium, NH4 plus. So this is NH4 plus. What is ammonia? An acid or base? Slightly acidic. Because ammonia is a weak base, its conjugate acid is also weak, which is ammonia, ammonium, this one. So ammonium here is a weak acid. Now, what do acids do? They donate protons, right? Let's think about Bronson Larry theory. So what's going to happen to this water is this proton is going to be donated to it. Everyone with me? So what are we going to form now? We're going to form ammonia. And we're going to form, what else? 
a drone in. Very good. Now, what we're doing here, everyone, is we're zooming into what's going on. Okay? So this should be double, double arrows here. So this is ammonium. Do you all see the NH4? You see how it's donating a proton because it's an acid? The hydrogen is being donated away from it. Okay? What's happening to the electron pairs that you see? Right? So have a look at this. Wrapping all this out. This hydrogen is going to get attached to this to form this NH4 plus structure. So this is our ammonia, ammonium. This is our ammonia. Okay? Have a look at the electron pairs. What's happening here? That hydrogen is moving into the ammonia to form ammonium. Do you see that? Ammonia is on the left-hand side. The hydrogen is moving into it to form ammonium. What is a hydrogen doing? When it forms its coordinate covalent bond, right, what is it doing to this electron pair? Do you all agree it's accepting the electron pair here? Right? So this hydrogen, since it's accepting this electron pair, is what we call a Lewis acid. AKA it's an electron pair acceptor. And what does this ammonia do? It's donating its electron pair to the hydrogen. Do you all see that? So the hydrogen can form this bond here. The ammonia is giving both of its electrons for the hydrogen. It's an electron pair donor. Do you all see that? So what is it acting as? A Lewis base. Electron pair donor. Okay? So all we're doing now is we're looking at the hydronium ion and the base or the acid that it combines with. Right? So whenever a hydronium ion combines with something, it needs to have already a lone pair of electrons to form a coordinate covalent bond. Does everyone agree? Without a coordinate covalent bond, that hydrogen can't bind to anything. So a base will always be accepting protons. Does everyone agree? For it to accept protons, it needs to donate an electron pair to the hydrogen. Does everyone agree? So that's what's happening here. Every single base to be a proton acceptor, must have an electron pair that it can donate to that proton. So and what we're doing now is we're shifting our definition from focusing on the proton to focusing on the electrons. So now we don't need to define acids based on hydrogen anymore. They don't even need to have hydrogen. If they donate an electron pair, they're a base. If they accept an electron pair, they are a acid. Now, for your trials in the HSC, they'll never ask you Lewis theory. This is all extension out of syllabus knowledge. Okay? They could give you an extract where they teach it to you on the spot and you have to answer questions. That's fair game. But you aren't required to memorize this. So as long as you generally understand what's going on, I'm happy. Okay? Do we get the overall gist here? Any questions at all? Okay. Bernard, any questions? Yeah? Okay, good. Good. Um, good. All right. All right, let's move on to our next dot point for our content focus. So I'll get Athaba. Could you read it out for us? Thabba, what's your answer to that question? What is the role of water in these solutions of acid and bases? You sure? Is that your answer? Maya, what is the role of water in acids and bases? You're all still thinking in terms of Arrhenius theory. Think in terms of bronsted lowry theory. What has water been doing? For an acid, an acid needs to donate its proton. Who's sitting there ready to accept the proton? Water. For a base, it needs to accept a proton. Who's there willing to donate the proton? Water. 
Exactly. Water acts as an amphiprotic substance that enables acids to donate protons and bases to accept protons. That is the one line answer to this entire inquiry question. Does that make sense? Good. Write it down. I'll, I'll write it down with you. Now, has anyone done the red cabbage indicator practical? Yeah? Tell us what you did. Uh, so basically, when you got the red cabbage, I didn't remember, but I didn't remember. Yeah. Why did you boil the red cabbage? It's eight months, and so it's an indicator, right? You can't just cook the red cabbage itself, otherwise, you're not done with the sausage. Boiling leeches the pigment from the cabbage. That's the goal of boiling. Okay, so when we talk about red cabbage, we don't care about the cabbage, we care about the red pigment. It has a name called anthocyanin. That is the name of the indicator we are creating. Does that make sense? So, goal is to leach that pigment out of the cabbage, concentrate it and use little droplets to see how it changes color. That's it, okay? So it's very simple, this practical. You get red cabbage, you add water in a beaker, you boil it for you know, five, 10 minutes to make sure that you leach all that color. And when the solution turns purple, you will drain the cabbage or you decant the solution, get rid of it in, into another beaker, and you'll have your distilled anthocyanin indicator. That's it. Then all you need to do is get a pasture pipette, to put two drops in random household solutions and you will know whether they're acidic or basic. Now, the key point here is to show you that this indicator has a varying set of colors. So this is the red cabbage indicator changing color. So in basic ranges, what color is it? In a basic range, what color does it go? Yeah, it goes green and then eventually it goes to a yellowish color. What about in acidic solutions? Yeah, so all you can do now is you can use household substances. If it changes to a red color, you know that substance is. Otherwise, yeah, it's that easy, right? So what do you need to know about this practical? So out of these steps here, do you need to memorize anything? I'd say no. Just remember the overall idea, and what are the three things you always do with a method? Been drilling it into your heads the whole year. What is it? Good. That's one. Two more. No, not past tense. Always present tense. Check with your school, though. So I know some school, I think Hurlston likes past tense, which is not how you should be doing it. Exactly. HSC is present, which is stupid because you're learning past tense, and then if you do that in HSC, you lose marks. But in HSC, they don't ask for methods. What else? And equipment and quantities. That's the three things. Okay. Good. So if you just generally know to consider those three, three things with a method, you always get the method correct. Good. All right. Here's a, a bit of a challenge question for all of you. Okay, now, from this equation, I want you all to derive pH plus pOH equals to um, 14. Do you all know what pOH is? It's the exact same thing. pH is negative log 10 of. Hydrogen, or now, what are you all going to be saying? Hydronium. POH is negative log 10 of hydroxide. Good. Now, whenever we get pH or POH formulas, what we need to do is we need to look at the self-ionization of water. What that means is even in a beaker of water, like your water bottle, a very tiny amount of water molecules react with one another as an acid and base. Very tiny amount, right? So what's going to happen is one water molecule will act as a proton donor, the other one will act as a proton acceptor, and what does it form? An acid and a base, hydronium and hydroxide, okay? 
So what would the K constant for this expression look like? Quickly, what's the expression? Good, hydronium times hydroxide. That's the K constant. Now at 25 degrees, this K constant is equal to one times 10 to the power of negative 14. Big or small number? Tiny. So that tells you only a very small amount of water is engaging in this reaction. Does that make sense? Majority of water exists as liquid water. Good. So now that you have this equation, I want you to derive Write this for me. So show me that pH plus pH is equal to 14. Before you do that, everyone, just make a small um, fix for me. This should not be H2O. This should be OH minus here. And the same here. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to zoom in because the answer is right here. So I don't want you to see that. So this, okay, you just change the water to OH minus. Okay, just for those two lines, that's it. All right, I want you to all to derive pH plus pH is equal to 14 at 25 degrees. What level of maths do we all do? Does anyone do general maths? Good, go to two and you can do this question, okay? Give you all about a minute to quickly do this. So, I thought would tell me what I do. Okay, what if I, okay, let's, okay, sure, we can do that way as well. But how about we try not changing it to X just yet, keep it as hydronium. So, we can say hydronium times hydroxide is equal to what at 25 degrees? Good. And since these are being produced at a one-to-one -one ratio to get made in equal amounts, right? So uh, we could say this is hydronium squared, which will give us a completely different formula. But for now, what do I do next with that one? You square root, okay. Okay, does anyone do a slightly different way? 
Put it here. Yeah. Okay, right, sure. All right, so let's hadronium equal to x. So we can say x squared is 1 times 10 power negative 14. What else can we say? Yep. Put one times ten power negative seven equals to concentration of hydroxide. Yep. Okay, you've proved something entirely different though, right? Remember, we're trying to prove this. Yeah. You proved pH is equal to 7, but I guess you're eventually getting there, sure. Yep. Same for POH. POH is also equal to negative log 10 of 1 times 10 power negative 7, and that equals to 7 as well. Therefore, pH plus POH is equal to 14. Is that what you all did? A slightly faster way to do it. Um, you, could, you could have logged it here. And then you could have started simplifying things and you would have got your answer much faster. Um, I'd say that's the way I'd do it, but do it however you'd like. Tanisha Rabab, did that make sense? What? Yeah, I think if you'd like to do it your own way, consider logging it here and you don't need to do all those extra steps. You just log 10 it here, then log 10 it there, and uh, you can go from there. Okay? Okay, sure. Um, okay. Who has done it? Did anyone do it that way originally? Good. All right, so Mahir, I'll let you take it away. So, so then log 10 of hydronium times hydroxide is equal to log 10 of uh, 10 to power negative 14. Yep, keep going. What would you do now? Yep. So it should just be one plus times H minus. Yep. Um Okay. And one times ten to the negative fourteen. Okay. But doesn't it just tell you negative fourteen equals negative fourteen? Yeah. So we proved that the same thing is true. Yeah. Yeah. Is I thought you could also do this, right? Couldn't you say? Isn't this the same as equals to log? Um, we can therefore say, um, what's it called, maybe here, if we times both sides by negative 1, we get negative log 10 of hydronium times hydroxide is equal to 14. And then can't we say that's the same as negative log 10 of hydronium, um, minus log 10 of hydroxide equals 14. And that's pH. Can we not say that? It'd be, it'd be plus and then minus. Yeah, like this. 
And so therefore we can say, well, this is a formula for pH. This is a formula for pOH. And so pH plus pOH is equal to 14. Good. But anyway, the reason I wanted us to go through this deep mathematical route is so you understand where these formulas are coming from. All these formulas link back to the self-ionization of water. That's how we calculate pH. That's how we derive the pH plus pOH formula. The other huge assumption we make is all of this is happening at good. The second you change the temperature, even at pH of water changes. It's not seven at 37 degrees, etc. Right? So that's um, they've asked a lot of exam questions based on this in trial papers, and I'll show you some very shortly. Good. All right, let's move on. You can look at the rest of the calculations in your own time, but uh, we will move onto a set of very important equations here. So far, you learnt the pH equations, right? Which is pH is equal to negative log 10 of uh, hydronium. pOH is equal to negative log 10 of hydroxide. You also learnt that pH plus pOH is equal to 14. Those are the three key equations, right? And obviously you can reverse these and you can say, well, hydronium ion concentration is 10 to the power of negative pH and hydroxide ion concentration is 10 to the power of negative pOH. Does everyone agree? So we can come to that conclusion. Now, here's a set of extra equations, and these are extremely high. I would say these are one of the most important mod 6 calculations you will be doing. And it's to do with Ka and Kb. Now, everyone, do you all agree pH, pOH, they're all a function of what? Yeah. Concentration. They're all functions of concentration. What is K a function of? So what does K tell you about an equilibrium? How far it lies to the right. When there's a very high K value, what does that mean? Which means it virtually has gone to completion, right? So what do you think all of these equations are going to be measuring? When we do PKA is negative log 10 of KA. We said Ka is a measure of equilibrium and completion. When a reaction goes to completion for an acid or base, what do we say about the acid or base? Strong. The degree these formulas are to do with not concentration, but strength. Make sure you understand that. It's going to say strength. So what does that mean? If an acid is strong, let's think about this. What will its Ka be? Let's conceptually understand this. Strong acid, what will its Ka be? High. What will its pKa be, given that pKa is negative log 10 of Ka? Very good. So strong acids have a low pKa. They test you on this. They'll give you a bunch of acids with different pKa values. The strongest acid has the lowest pKa value. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Also, I wanted to mention something about your exams, right? So, I think a lot of you messaged me about asking for an extension for your exams. Your exam will be next week. Are you all happy with that? Final week of class, come in, just do the exam. Then over the holidays, it will be marked, and then when you come back, first lesson, you get your marks and how you work. It is uh, two hours, that's right. Uh, 55 marks to our exam. Good. Two or, two or one and a half, I believe. One and a half. Because it's 55 marks, 54. Maybe 52 marks. I need to check the paper. But uh, one and a half, which means we have half an hour for me to go through anything, questions you have that you've done as well. Okay? Good. So strong acid, high Ka, low pK. K is the equilibrium constant. That's all it is. It's just K, right? We just put an A because it's an acid. KB is for a base. So it's the same principle with a, with a base. A strong base has a 
high KB, which has a low PKB. That's it. Very good. Make sure you conceptually understand this and also mathematically. Okay? Very good. So it's the exact same formulas. Have a look at this. PK plus PKB equals 14. KB is equal to negative log 10. Uh, PK is negative log 10 of K. Now, the only thing I do want to stress is this equation here. Very important you understand this one. Okay? This equation is relating to conjugate acid-base pairs. So I want you to put a red bracket around this. And this is to do with conjugate acid-base pairs. In water. What I mean by this, everyone, is, Pranav, give me a weak acid. Okay, acetic acid, right? So this is the equation for acetic acid in water. This is what we would have got. I'm not going to write um, states, but that's... Now let's say the K for this is Ka, right? Kb represents the equation for the conjugate base in water. So what I mean by that is, what's the conjugate base? This is your acid. Who's the conjugate base? Good. So we need to have another equation of acetate reacting with what? That's the big mistake students make. They will look at the equation of acetate with hydronium. It's not that. It's the equation of acetate with water. I know what you're all thinking. You're talking about the reverse reaction, which is acetate plus um, hydronium. But that's not what this equation is about. Kb represents the conjugate base also reacting with water. Okay? So it's going to be um, CH3COOH plus OH minus. That's KB. Can anyone prove, can anyone mathematically prove this equation to me? I'll give you another minute, and after this, you'll get a break. KW is the self ionization of water, which is just hydroxide times hydronium. That's KW. Use this, use this equation here and prove to me that when I multiply K times KB, I'll get one times 10 prime negative 14. And this is at 25 degrees. Start off by multiplying K by KB. Find the expressions, multiply them, and start simplifying, and you'll get something very interesting. Again, back. This is, this is 
It's not very much math, it's more, I'd say, conceptual. Um, we'll break it down and see how we go. All right, so let's understand this. So what would the form of a K be in this case? K is going to be, yeah. Yeah. Good, divided by? Are you sure? I should have included states for you, but you should know this. Do you add? Okay, good. See, you could add H2O, but the only thing is H2O would be, what would it be? One, right? So, look, for your case, I'll, I'll, I'll go with what you've mentioned, and we'll, we'll include H2O, okay? Um, if you'd like to, it's also fine. But just know that would be one arbitrarily. You could choose to include it or not. Now, what is, how can this be simplified further? It looks really messy so far. Pardon? Yes, is there any other way it could be simplified? Are these not equal to one another? Right? Do you agree they occur to one to one? Very molecule of CH3CO you form, you also form H3O plus. Okay? Keep that in mind. We'll write the full equations first. That's also H3O squared divided by CH3COOH. Right? That's K. What about KB? What is KB equal to? Good. Divided by? Sorry, hydroxide times acetate or acetic acid? Good. Good. COO minus. Okay. How about we start? Would you like to add H2O as well? You can do it. Um, but that's just one. Okay. If I do K times KB, do you all agree? I just multiply this with that. Now, look at what's on the numerator and denominator for each. So, CH3CO minus is at the numerator for Ka, and it's at the denominator for Kb. Does everyone see that? Uh, CH3CO is the denominator for Ka and the numerator for Kb. We said water is just one. So, Ka times Kb is what? That's it. Hydronium times hydroxide. And what is that also? Yeah, which is one times set by negative 14. 
Does that make yep? Yeah? No, that's KW. KW is 1 times 10 to the power negative 14. So that's it. So the reason that we're going very maths, even though in chemistry they're never going to ask you to derive this, is once you understand where these formulas come from, you'll be very comfortable using it and you won't have any issues in the future. Now, I know I said I'll give you a five minute break. Before I do that, We'll come back to this equation here. We haven't learned buffers yet. Is uh, I would like you to do this question. Oh no! Uh, you, can you do this question? pH of K. Calculate the pH of. Yeah, you can. Throwing you on the deep end. After this question, I promise you, you'll get your break. Okay. This is an immediate challenge question. This is the hardest that a pH calculation can get, okay? Give you all about four or five minutes to... And don't worry, right, you don't have to rush into it. You can take a couple of seconds to think about your approach. This is a very challenging question, especially for most HSC students. Hopefully deriving these equations makes a bit more sense. I'm sorry, I forgot the equation for carbonic acid. Okay, um, treat it like a Bronsted-Larry equation. Okay, so if you have carbonic acid, what does an acid do? H2CO3 formula. Good luck. This is, um, if you get this, I think this will be very good at instilling confidence. Because if you can do this question, mathematically you can answer any HC chemistry question. Okay, maybe I'll keep you all about three minutes. Would you like a five minute break before doing this question? Maybe, as long as you're more energized. What do you all prefer? Give this question a go first? Yeah. Okay, give it a go first, then I'll give you a break, and then I'll tell you the answer. Okay, what would you prefer? Five minute break and then go through a solution, or solution first? Okay, done. Am I right? Okay. I'm going to do exactly what all of you would have done. So, Rabab, what's the first thing you do with any chemistry calculation question? Good. What's the equation? Tanisha? Pause for a moment. The pKa of a carbonic acid solution. Does it have any sodium in it? If I gave you a bowl of carbonic acid, would it have sodium in it? Okay, so what would the equation be? Okay, so the first equation I would be thinking of is the carbonic acid solution. Carbonic acid is in water. That's what it is, right? So I draw carbonic acid. And what would the carbonic acid do? It would combine with water. And what do we form? Brosillary, everyone. What do we get? Yeah, right? Good. We get H3O+, plus, but I would, I'd write the... Like this and this. Okay, good. So include your states, make sure it's balanced. Bronsted Larry equations don't require balancing because you just move your hydrogen across, so it's not going to be much to do there. Okay, now that's the first equation. What data do we have? Okay, so pKa is found to be 6.35. Now, here is a huge learning point for all of you, right? When you have pKa, you can always find Ka, right? And you can always do the opposite. But Ka is usually the most useful, okay? Keep that in mind. What else do we have? Calculate the pH of a 0.2 mole per liter sodium hydrogen carbonate solution. 
Are we talking about the same solution here or a completely different solution? Different. So we need a second equation. Does everyone agree? So for sodium hydrogen carbonate, what would the reaction be? Now, this is where it's a little bit confusing because sodium hydrogen carbonate on its own, all it's going to do is ionize first. It's going to form sodium and the hydrogen carbonate ion. Do we all agree? Right? Is a sodium ion useful in any way? It's useless. All these ions bound to the hydroxide ion, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, they're useless. They're only used to form that base. They don't actually contribute to the basicity. Make sense? We care much more about this side. So, sure, I'll write this equation, but the actual equation I care about everyone is the bicarbonate ion that's going to combine with what does it combine with? Think about this. This is in a bucket of water, right? So what is it combining with? Water. And what do I form? This is a base. So what do we form? Yeah. Carbonic acid. And hydroxide ions. Good. All right, so I've done my equations. What's the next step? Data. What is my data? Is there any other data that I have? Yeah, so I've got the concentration of my hydrogen carbonate. It's the same as sodium hydrogen carbonate. So that's 0 0.2 moles per, per liter. Okay, sure. Um, do I have anything else? Well, what can we do next? We can draw a diagram. Do we need to draw a diagram here? They're not too important because there's not many, many steps involved, right? What's the next thing I do then, Rabab, if I'm still stuck? You guys can't forget these steps. If you get these steps, you will not be able to answer these questions. So what's the next important step? Yeah, so what is it asking me to find? I want to find pH. To find pH, what do I need? Good. Now, think about this. In this equation, is there any hydronium ions? Do you see H 3 plus? Yeah, second one. No. So how do you think we want to find pH? But hydroxide. So what can we find? Maybe we can get pH from finding pOH. Okay, and for us to find pOH, what do we need to find? Concentration of OH minus. So do you see how framing the question kind of gives you a plan of attack generally? Okay, let's start with this. We've got pK. There's nothing I can do with a pK as of yet, right? But uh, what can I convert the pKa to? Good. What, so what you should be doing now is considering all the equations you know about pKa. What equations do we know about pKa? Good. What else do we know about pKa? Good. pKb equals to 14. Would you like to follow this route potentially? Why would you be considering this route? Remember what I told you guys. This is the acid. Who's the conjugate base? Yeah. And what is it also reacting with? I told you, it needs to both be reacting with water. Is it not satisfying all those conditions? Right? So. What would have helped you out a ton is if you all recognized if this reaction is a Ka reaction, this reaction is a Kb reaction. The second you get there, you get much closer to your answer. Okay? Very good. So we can say, sure, pKa plus pKb equals to 14. So what is pKb equal to? Yeah, 14 minus 6.35, which was? 7.65. Now, we've got a pKb. Can we not find... Well, what did I say? If you've got pKa, you can find Ka. If you've got pKb, what can you find? 
you can find KB, right? So what's KB? 10 to the power of negative PK, PKB, which is 10 to the power of negative 7.65. Now, I want you all to notice this, right? We had to somehow jump from this equation to this equation. Did you all recognize that? So you should have been thinking what links the two equations together, which should have led you to KA times KB. That's the logic of thinking, okay? Good, so what's KB? What do we get? Um, 22 minus 4 times 10 to the negative. Everyone got that? 22 times 4. Times 10 to the negative 9. Okay, we'll take that. Now, Tanisha, when I have K, what should you be thinking about? Yeah, what can you find from that? Um, no. But K is the KQ. We just call it KA, right? So, Rabat, if I've got K, what should I be thinking about now? If I have K, what should I be thinking about now? Yes. Specifically, what uh, what am I looking for? Yeah, it's that, that's what K is. Conceptually, you're completely right. But I'm thinking mathematically, what should I be doing for now? How do I go from K to concentrations? Good. Which, remember, equilibrium concentrations, what should you be considering? Whenever you have K, rice table is the first thing that should come to your mind. Does that make sense? So there's a very logical progression here. KA, you always think rice table. You can't forget that. Okay? So always consider that. Good. So we've got KB, and good, we can find the expression for KB. KB is equal to hydroxide ion concentration times... H2CO3 divided by HCO3 minus. Everyone agree? Yeah? How can I simplify this? How can I simplify? If I tell you about K, it's going to get way more complicated because I had a whole other formula to it, right? But what I can realize is, yes, that's equal to OH squared. Good job. Do you all agree it's a one-to-one -one ratio here? They're equal in quantity in their production. So we can say that's just OH minus squared divided by HCO3 minus. Because remember, what are we trying to do, everyone? We're trying to find OH minus concentration. We figure that from step one. The second we find OH minus, we find POH, we find pH. So the goal is to find OH minus here. Okay, now that's going to be equal to KB. Do I have the equilibrium concentration of bicarbonate though? What is this concentration here that I was given? Was it initial, equilibrium, change? I think you would know. The point two. You guys need to think about this, right? When someone measures or creates 0.2 moles per liter of sodium hydrogen carbonate, they don't account for the equilibrium shifting to the right. Okay? The 0.2 is the initial concentration. Then it will, you know, the forward reaction will happen, concentration will slightly decrease, some product will form. So this is initial concentration, okay? So we're gonna write CI. Um, let's do a very quick rice table. Doing a very quick rice table, what we get is we've got bicarbonate. We get the water, we've got um, carbonic acid on the right-hand side. 
we've got OH minus. Okay? So initially it's 0.2. Everyone agree? Moles per liter? We don't know how much it decreases by, but its equilibrium will be 0.2 minus x. Contrastingly, hydroxide and carbonic acid are initially zero, and they'll increase by x. So they'll go to a value of x. So what is Kb equal to then, in terms of x? x squared, yeah, divided by 0.2 minus x. But this is the thing. Even if you guys assumed it was equilibrium, you'd be right now, because what are we about to do? That's equal to a. We're going to end up with a quadratic equation. Does everyone see that? So what can we do in chemistry? What did I tell you? What? Yeah, so we assume that x, only for the denominator, is pretty much zero. So now the equilibrium becomes the initial concentration. So you can say x squared divided by 0.2 is equal to a. Can anyone tell me what is x equal to? Does that make sense, Tanisha, as to what we've, we've done? Rabab, makes sense? Good. Our goal is trying to find hydroxide ion concentration. And whenever you have K, what should you be thinking, Rabab? Yes, never forget that. If the second you forget that, these questions become very, very hard. What is X, by the way? Of? There you go. I'm not going to say anything. Can you now find pH for me? Good. Do it and tell me your final answer. Now, I know this is a very long question, but like I told you, this is the hardest that a pH question can ever get. So what I want you all to do is put an asterisk around this question and redo the entire question when you get home in your own time. Because this may be in your exam next week. Okay? What's the exam on? Mod 5. Oh, yes. It will be a variance in terms of K. Right? So it won't be a pH-based question. But it'll be a very long K calculation question you'll be doing. Maybe KSP, from what I remember. Good. So what's POH, everyone? Store that as B. Plug to the B. And then pH is equal to 14 minus. Uh, let's see. 14 minus C. So what's our final answer? Okay, now this is where you have to finally think about it. Does that make sense conceptually? Do you expect a concentration of sodium hydrogen carbonate to have a pH of 8.3? Is it an acid or base hydrogen carbonate? Yeah, I said it was a weak base, right? It's amphiprotic, as we went through, but slightly basic, okay? So, it checks out. So, how many sig figs per note? One, point two is one. So it's going to be, it rounds off to point two is one sig fig, right? So it's going to be nine, one sig fig. That's it. Good job. So to summarize the key things you would have learned from this question, the reason this question was hard, everyone, is because you needed to realize that you had written the Ka and Kb equations. And so you can use the Ka times Kb uh, formula. The second thing that made this question hard is whenever you have K, what should you be thinking? Price table. If you did not apply those two principles, this question would be very hard for you. Okay? Now, does, do you have a bit of clarity? So to reiterate, what did we do? Equation, data, frame the question, consider a diagram, and if you're stuck, find moles. It's a five-step rule for any calculation. Right? Once you do that, you follow through. So you find K, so you use the rice table, find concentrations, find pH. Okay? And did you see how important framing the question was? The second you frame the question, you can think about how we get there. And that is one of the most important steps in calculation, having a plan before you put pen to paper. Okay? Good. Now, 
I want to apologize. I told you I'd give you a break, but I lied because we have 15 minutes left. I'm not going to give you a break when there's 10 minutes left to class. So we're going to power through for the next 14 minutes. Is that okay? All right. Let's do... This question, PH. Sure, do this question. So again, three minutes to do it. Go as fast as you can, follow the steps we apply, okay? The same five steps we always apply. This one's a bit easier.
How do we go? Good. Bob? I thought we had pH 14.5. Good. And we have all concentrations 14.5. So I should try following the part of the floor. What does mono mean? What does protein mean? Good. So what would the general formula be? I said X plus K towards like a blue matter at the Okay, yeah, that works. Then I got the non constructed because that's the usual concentration now. Yep. Oh, never mind, never mind. Did you do a rice table? Yeah, I did. You should have done that. Yeah, I think I did that. Good. What are you thinking about? Well, I think, I mean, I got the concentration this time, and then. Good. Good. Are you all realizing whenever you get a K question, what should you be thinking straight away? The, the only time you don't think the rice table is KSP. KSP, you can follow what we've always been doing. Ralph, got an answer? Manu, got an answer? All right, let's see how we went. Okay, so we'll start with Tanisha. What's the first thing you always do? Good. So what does monoprotic mean? It means it's got one hydrogen that it can donate. So that's the formula, HA or HX, call it what you'd like. If it was triprotic, what would it be? H3X, does that make sense? So this acid's general formula is HA plus water gives you Good. See, this is the thing that I, I personally don't like writing hydronium straight away. Um, oh, no, actually, I do quite commonly, so that's fine. Um, and then A minus, that's completely fine. Good. Liquid, aqueous. Do we know if it's strong or weak? Yeah, it, if it's got a K, it's most likely going to be a weak acid. So for now, we'll put the equilibrium mass, right? Good. What's next for now? So I'm stuck. What do I do? That's it. What data do we have? Good. What else do we have? What concentration is that again? And at what time point is that? Initial equilibrium. Good. So now we're learning. See, that's what I like to see. We're learning from my previous questions. So whenever they give you the concentration, they give you concentration time equals zero, which is initial. Okay, good. Now, what else can I do? I'm still stuck, let's say. Frame the question. So what is it asking me for? Good. So Ka equals question mark. How do I find Ka? Yeah, good. That's definitely true from PK, but do I have PK? Is PK a pH? Are they similar at all? Remember I told you, pH, all of that is to do with concentration. PK is all to do with strength. They're completely two different things. So, Athava, can I do anything from PK? Can I find PK directly? So it's a dead end. But I like that thought. It's a good thought. What else can I do? Concentrations. How do I do that? Yeah, through pH, you're right. So using pH, and what will I then use? Yeah, so I need to do a rice table. So that's the plan of action I'm going to take, right? Good, let's start this question. So let's convert pH into hydronium. This is the other very important thing. Whenever you have pH, you should always think you also have hydronium. You've been given two pieces of data in one, okay? So uh, Mahi, what's the hydronium ion concentration? Good. We can keep it as that if we'd like. Don't mind. Good. What can we do now? We've got an equilibrium concentration, because that's what pH is. It's an equilibrium value. We've got initial. What should we be doing? Done. Right. Let's do a rice table. 
R I C E. We don't care about water. Good. So ratios are one to one to one. What's the initial concentration of HA? 0.2. What's the pH? It was uh, 10 to the power negative 5. And what's the initial concentration of hydronium or above? Uh, zero. Good. And A minus, also zero. So we've increased by how much? 10 to the power negative 5. And that means the reactant must have. Yeah, that's it. So K is very easy. It's just hydronium squared divided by H8, which is 10 to the power negative 5 squared divided by minus. minus. That's very important. If you just subbed in 0 0.2, you'd get the question wrong. That's why it's so important. This is initial concentration. Good. So what do we get for K? How many sig figs? Good, you should always have a full answer and then round it off. So, oh, okay, zero, 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 two, five. okay. Two, five? Yeah. Okay, rounds off to that, one sig fig. That's it? Not too bad, right? Whenever you're asked about K, what must you always think about? Good. I want to hear that first thing next time I ask you guys what, what K should implicate you to. Okay? Good. So learning points from today. KA, PKA, what is that to do with? Strength. PH is all to do with the independent. Okay? Good. If you have an acid ionizing in water and the conjugate base ionizing in water, what two equations should you consider? Um, uh, PKA times PKA. Not times. It's KA times KB equals to KW or 1 times the power negative 14 or PKA plus PKB equals to 14. Okay? Good. And if you have pH in my head, what can you always find? Good. And if I have PK, what can I always find? Uh, yeah. Remember, what is PKA, K all about? Strength, not concentration. So you couldn't be able to go and find concentration of hydroxide. So whenever you have PK, you can find K. Does that make sense? Good. So that's the last thing. Anything else? Any questions at all? Make sense? I know, I put you on the very deep end. This question was adapted from a 2019 exam choice trial, which floored, I think, 70% of students that did that question. And those are students at the end of the HSC. So the fact that you guys were able to at least start is really good, okay? I've exposed you to the hardest question for PHPK, so it's easier from here, okay? Good. Uh, are you all doing the additional questions? Because next week, if it's your exam, I expect all the additional questions um, shown to me as well. For module five? For module five, yeah. Do you all have a copy of all the additional questions you've been doing? Yeah. Perfect. As long as you can show me the paper and then the questions working, I'm happy with that, okay? The HSC chemistry additional questions. No, not the Nesson ones, the trial ones that I've collated for more five years. Yes, the ones at the end. You must do all of them. Okay. If you do all of them, I guarantee you'll smash your exams. Okay, so I think to study for the exams, do the homework and you will do really well. Okay, good. All right, everyone. Best of luck for next week. Next week's our last lesson, remember. Come in exam ready. Get sleep. Um, I would like to rank you guys, okay? I may not put it up depending on how we go, but I, for me at least, I want to see how you are going, okay? Good. Have a good week, and I will see you next week. Enjoy school.